many apologies uh, for those that, uh, that are here for being late, and apologies for the organisers. I'm sure I gave them a bit of a scare. Uh, I did intend uh, to uh, begin with an apology had I arrived on time, and that was because I've been ill since the event that Eileen was at uh, last week, and I had this uh, terrible migraine attacks uh, last evening, and haven't prepared for this as I would have liked, so apologies for being incoherent uh, throughout this presentation. Um, one or two disclaimers, I speak on my own behalf here uh, as a, a student in law, uh, doing a PhD as just explained by the chair, uh, and part of that has uh, involved the, the movement, and as a result I have studied the movement so far as it relates to human rights law. I'm not a sociologist, and so therefore uh, the, the movement and communities of movements, whether they're religious or not, is something that is outside of my area of expertise, but I am a keen student in that respect. I am the executive director of the Dialogue Society, which is an organisation that was inspired by uh, including people like Fethullah Gulen, uh, and as a result, I personally feel inspired through, by his teachings, including others. Uh, and I feel that that gives me an exposure to what the movement is about, and hopefully I'll be able to draw upon that in this presentation. Now, 20 minutes is obviously very, very uh, slim to do uh, justice to any movement, so I won't intend to say a great deal about everything, rather concentrate on a few more areas and say more about that. However, it is a new movement in terms of its uh, interest in academia, and as a result, I would imagine that perhaps there are some areas that I need to cover as first base. Fethullah Gulen is a Turkish uh, scholar, a Muslim scholar, uh, and a peace activist. He was born in 1938 in eastern Turkey. Uh, he has a religious education that he uh, derived from his father, his grandmother, and then various scholars in eastern uh, and in central Anatolia. Uh, and these would cover the, bas the basic Islamic uh, sciences that you would expect any scholar of his right to have gone through, uh, and he was appointed state teacher in the 1958-1960s, and thereafter was a state preacher himself in Turkey, mainly in the, uh, uh, the, the, the western coast of Turkey, uh, where he uh, began his uh, professional uh, state preacher uh, profession. Uh, he is a mainstream Muslim scholar. Uh, he is of the Sunni Hanafi tradition. He has over 60 books to his name and hundreds of recorded uh, sermons that are distributed now on the internet but previously on audio cassettes. He is regarded by most, if not all, I would add, uh, credible uh, Islamic scholars in Turkey to be a scholar of profound learning and authority, but now also increasingly by Arab scholars as well, mainly because of the publication that the movement now produces in the Arab world called Hira magazine, and so he is now attracting uh, their uh, support uh, uh, and uh, endorsement. Um, he is informed uh, as well by tasawwuf, by the Sufi tradition, which I don't really like the word because it doesn't do justice, justice to the term tasawwuf, the spiritual, uh, if you like, teachings uh, of Islam. He leads a very ascetic, ascetic lifestyle. He's a celibate. He lives with a very small, close number of students. He's currently uh, residing in the uh, United States and has been for about 10 years in a semi-self-imposed uh, uh, form of exile. Um, and he spends most of his time in worship and study with those uh, close number of students. He's not a reformist, he's not a modernist. However, I do believe that he's engaged in ijtihad, reinterpretation, and tejdid, renewal. Uh, he is referred to as Hojefendi by many uh, people in Turkey. That doesn't give him a holy status. He never accepts any such thing of any kind. Uh, it rather is a term of respectable teacher. That's how uh, he's referred to. I personally have the uh, privilege of, of, of visiting him on two or three occasions. And I can say that, for example, in Turkey, when you go in, or when your father enters a room where somebody respectable enters a room, it's custom to stand up. It's also the case in schools in Turkey. You would stand up when your teacher comes in. And just to underline the point of not having or not claiming a holy status, if people do stand up out of respect, he doesn't come in and he says, well, look, sit down, I'm merely coming in and out, you don't need to be uh, doing that. So that's um, a bit of background about him. The movement is recognized uh, as one of the most dynamic, uh, faith-inspired uh, movements to originate from uh, the Muslim world. It was recently voted, well, Fethullah Gulen was recently voted the top public intellectual uh, by the internet poll organized by Foreign Affairs and Prospect magazine. So that's a bit of background about Fethullah Gülen himself, but what makes him interesting uh, is that he inspires this movement, this transnational movement which now numbers in its millions. It's active over 110 different countries, and I'll say a bit more about that in a moment. What I would like to say is that, in terms of his relationship with the movement, is that he inspires it, he doesn't control it, and he motivates people to engage in the forms of activities that he advises them. He provides initial, initial uh, principles of 
activism and how people should be engaged, such as being non-partisan, for example, such as being proactive and not reactive to uh, the popular agenda. As a result, he doesn't have any form of formal leadership over the movement. Rather, he advises collective, consultative, local decision-making at the grassroots of uh, society. I've said that the movement is now numbering millions. It's impossible to put an exact figure to it because there's no central uh, hierarchy or no central uh, census data or, or, or place that you would uh, pledge a, a membership to. Um, it's loosely connected, loosely connected through uh, shared ideals and principles, and volunteerism is really at the spirit and key of it all. Uh, in terms of the key areas of practice, it's education. Gulen uh, advocates the need of education, I'll explain why in a moment. And there are now, again, estimated about a thousand schools uh, in over 115 different countries, which are non-denominational. They follow the national curriculum of the country in which they are based and they try to provide a well-rounded education that concentrates on parental involvement, mentoring, uh, and excellence in academia. Interfaith intercultural dialogue is another area uh, that the, uh, the volunteers are, uh, are encouraged to engage in, uh, and as a result, there are a number of organizations across the world that promote intercultural dialogue, community cohesion. Media is a third area, uh, and I'll explain the, the relevance of these particular areas of, of activism. The media is a third area. Zaman uh, Daily is the highest circulating newspaper in Turkey, and there are a number of channels associated with the movement. And then you have the social activities uh, that have been ongoing for, for a number of years, since the 1960s, 1965 onwards. In terms of the nature of the movement, it's non-political, it's non-reactionary, it's non-sectarian, it's non-confrontational. It's inclusive and it's independent. Um, it's not an Islamist organization because it doesn't believe in the politicization or the instrumentalization of religion in, uh, in, in politics. It's not a religious organization, however. It, it began as a faith-based movement. It then, I argue, became a faith-inspired movement. That you have people from faith or no faith, for example, with the Dialogue Society, which is very clear in terms of its uh, origins and forms of inspiration. We have 12 members on our board of advisors. Only two of those happen to be Muslim. The rest are of non-Muslim, and in fact we have a number of people who are of no faith. And I say that because obviously the movement for many people would be associated with a faith or a religion. Uh, and I only make this clear because it was, it was made clear in the event that we had uh, just on Tuesday, where Bill Park, one of our advisors who is at King's College, is a militant atheist on his own account. But he has no problems uh, with supporting the Dialogue Society and contributing to it and providing advice for it. And that's why I argue that this isn't actually a religious movement in the sense that it doesn't have a religious objective of enhancing one religion uh, above the other. Rather, people are inspired by faith, just as with the schools, for example. Um, people come along and they, they donate to those schools, and they do so partly because they feel that this is a good charitable cause that they hope and expect to be returned to them in the afterlife. So there is an element of faith there. But the schools themselves are non-denominational, and they recognize that, and they recognize that these schools do not have a religious objective in themselves. Uh, and that's another reason why I say that this isn't a religious organization, uh, and why I feel that it is new, it is a movement, but in terms of considering it to be a new religious movement, uh, I would say no, it's a, perhaps faith-inspired. Funding is local, and perhaps there will be questions about that, and I'll, and I'll pick upon that during the, the Q&A. Um, its objectives, and there are a number of people who will say a number of things about its objectives. Um, one or two of them is if, achieving to be a full human potential, achieving your full human potential by reforming yourself through inner endeavour and social activism. I think that's one of the key definitions of its objectives. Achieving our full potential as a society through uniting around shared high human values in overcoming social common ills. That's another. Gulen defines three major problems, and you find this in the works of Said Nursi as well. Uh, ignorance, discord, and uh, ignorance, discord, and poverty as the three social ills. And Gulen says, as does Nursi, that the way to overcome this is through a well-rounded education, dialogue, and partnership. And that's why you find the forms of activism in, in the way in which they've been described uh, above. Now, I have some... Uh, points that I want to make, why I think it's important to, to understand the movement and why I feel that the movement is, is influential. It began in Turkey, but now it's spread all over the world. There are about 18 schools, for example, in Australia. There are schools, there are two schools in the UK. There are schools in Afghanistan, 10 schools in northern Iraq. Um, so all across the world. And I think it's important to be able to understand the dynamics of that. 
Firstly, a point of Gulen's influence. Why do we feel that Gulen is influential? I feel that he's influential because he combines three essential characteristics in the way in which he uh, carries himself. And I call this the trio for formula of devout, devout intellectual alim. Alim in the sense that he has, without doubt, those who his friends and foes will, will agree, that he is an Islamic scholar of incredible proportion. I won't go into why I believe that, because I don't believe that I have the time for it. But he is an alim. That, that's the first point, an Islamic scholar. But he's also an intellectual. He's very well read in our contemporary sciences, philosophy, history, and you'll find him not just referring to these in his sermons, but also allowing these uh, sciences and, and, and literature to inform and shape his understanding of Islam as well. So he interprets Islam within contemporary times and contemporary times within Islam. That's why when he's speaking to an audience, and his audience is generally now very young, they will find a connection with what he's saying because they feel that it's relevant to their life. So that's the second point. He's also an intellectual, very well read in contemporary times. But thirdly, and what differentiates him from perhaps very well educated academics who are speaking to Harvard or LSE uh, audiences such as yourselves, is that he uh, is devout. He's very devout and he's very practicing. And this comes across in his sermons, this comes across in his writings. So he's emotionally as well as intellectually and spiritually attached to the topic that he is discussing. That gives him the street credibility to be able to influence the masses. He is speaking to the congregation. And what he says and what Tariq Ramadan says and what Abdul Karim Surush says and what other intellectuals say might very, look very similar. But the fact is that he can move the masses as he's demonstrated in Turkey uh, and change the way that they're thinking. So he's a grassroots person. It began from the mosque sermons and moved uh, further out. Uh, and that's why I feel that it's important to understand these particular characteristics of Gulen. In terms of his views, again, some areas that I think are important to understand. On politics, on democracy, Gulen said in the 1990s, there can be no return from, from democracy. It's not perfect, but it's the best system that we have. We have to perfect it further, and we have to work for it, and it is a religious obligation for Muslims to go out and vote. He said this in 1990, when, for me, for example, it was very difficult to internalize this. I remember going to uh, secondary school here myself, thinking about this, grappling with this issue of whether democracy was Islamic or not, and that I couldn't see in the Quran whether I could internalize it. The fact that he had the credibility, and with that credibility said what he said, changed my views on it. I also believe that it's very uh, instructive in changing the views of a large proportion of the Turkish populace, including the current ruling AKP party, because they were coming and going to the meetings that, that, that the Gulen and his movement were organizing. On secularism, for example, and this is an area that we as British Muslims are yet to come to a consensus on. He says, for example, that an American form of secularism, one that is friendly and not anti-religion, uh, is actually acceptable and it's very Islamic. Islamic State, he says there's no such thing as an Islamic State. Islam teaches about principles, to be just, to, be, uh, to have meritocracy, uh, to freedom of religion, and he says that these values and principles are more alive in the West than they are in the so-called Islamic world. Uh, and these are the principles that any state should adhere to and follow. On human rights, again, a number of areas that he covers and says that it is the fun. He attaches human rights to the purpose of creation because he says human rights provides us with the ability to choose and God wants it to be chosen. So the lack of human rights annihilates the, the, the point of creation from an Islamic point of view. It's so thoroughly connected. And I think these arguments are important. Whether you, understand, whether you believe in, in their Islamic veracity or not is, is one point. But the fact that he connects it in the way that he does and saying that you know, without human rights you have no purpose of existence is very instructive and very influential uh, for the wider Muslim mass who do take that as credible. On terrorism, uh, he was one of the first uh, Islamic scholars to come out and, and condemn the attacks and said no Muslim can be a terrorist and no terrorist can be a Muslim. The point that he was making, and I think that he wasn't speaking here so much as an Islamic theologian, but as somebody who provides ideas, is that if you're a Muslim, you cannot, your faith is so diametrically opposed to killing anyone that you cannot uh, and should not engage in that. And then he went further uh, a, a couple of years later and said, based on a particular saying of the Prophet, that the moment somebody commits a crime as horrendous as terrorism, faith leaves them. Faith leaves their body. And because they don't have the time to repent, and they die in that particular state, they die outside of the fold of the religion that they thought they were serving. Again, theologians may argue the, the, the veracity of that, but I would say that with the credibility that he has, this is as far out that you can say this is a strong statement that you can give. And this is why you don't find any form of, not only not terrorism, but any form of confrontation, any form of uh, sectarianism, any form of discord 
uh, that the movement is associated with, and it tries to avoid that. Um, in terms of its mode of activism, again, one of the things that Gulen has changed. In the past, if you were a pious Muslim, you would give money to a mosque, or you would give money to a, to a, a, a student, a Muslim student in difficulty. Gulen changed our whole <coughs> understanding uh, on what is Islamically acceptable to do as, as a form of Islamic activism. And he said, your loyalty, first and foremost, lies to the community in which you live, not to Muslims, necessarily, the community in which you live. And you provide service to that community. Um, I've just been told that my 20 minutes starts now, so... <laughs> um, and as a result, that, that form of activism can be non-denominational. You've got to understand that the, 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 the mentality of the person who's giving money. They feel that they have to somehow uh, ensure that that money goes for an Islamic cause. And Gulen changed that. He said, look, that's not what it is. If it's your community, that's where you live, that's what you do. And that's why in 1980s he said, and it's, it's easy to say this now, but it's more difficult to say it then. In 1980s he said, we have a sufficient number of mosques, calm down on the mosques now, open schools. And he didn't say open schools that teach Islam, he said open non-denominational schools. These were schools that the Americans were opening in Turkey at the time. And he was, you know, he was hit from all corners of the religious spectrum in Turkey for saying that. Uh, and, and he was able to take uh, religion out of uh, activism, uh, and in that way turn it into non-denominational form of activism, but nonetheless accepted. And that's where you find the funding coming from. In the 1990s he said, and this was before 9-11, and this was before the mushrooming of all these dialogue organizations. He said, intercultural dialogue is a must, it's a part of our humanity, it's a part of who we are, and it's what, something that we should do. Very recently he came out and said something, he said, As we are first humans and then Muslims. Our humanity comes first. Those who have a religious, pious background, observant, practicing, will know how difficult it is to say that. Um, because they fear that the consequences of saying that will be to be less practicing, less pious, uh, and less observant. On integration, he says, follow the law of the land, but not just the law of the land. Become loyal to the country of your residence. If there's a speed limit of 90 miles per hour and you're doing 110 and you die and you kill somebody, that's homicide and that's suicide. Religiously, that's how he puts it. Uh, in terms of uh, the movement, I'll use the last couple of minutes, if I may, Chair, on, uh, on the movement. I've already said that it's non-partisan, it's apolitical, non-confrontational, it's civil, and this is what's important. It's not a top-down approach. It began in the 1960s, you can trace it if you look at the if I had time, I could go over the various uh, formation stages that it went through. But it began from the community, and that's the key. That's the key here. It's not government funded. It's not a corporate uh, organization. It's not uh, fed by millions and billions of dollars from, from other countries. It's community led. It's community supported. That's why 110 different countries, uh, education, media, uh, business, all kinds of different activities. You cannot explain that by saying that one person is sitting there and organizing all of this. It's not. You know, he probably doesn't know the dialogue side exists. We take the ideas, we take certain principles, we deliberate, we consult, we talk to Eileen, we talk to all kinds of people, and then we come out with our own action plan and we follow that through. That's the point of success. You cannot have one model and then separate that into 110 different countries and have success in each and every one of those. So I think it's important to be able to look at the fact that it's local. Locally driven, civil, and uh, communal. That's what makes the Tejdid, his discourse, his interpretations, and his, uh, his principles adaptable, flexible, durable, and practical. It began as Turkish, yes, but now you find in Turkmenistan, which again, it has Turkic roots, the Turkmen students who came out of these students are now running the schools. The same thing you find in uh, Azerbaijan, and the same things you find slowly happening elsewhere. The idea is it becomes itself sustaining and you have people, indigenous people, running those schools. That's why he's against the idea of taking a chunk of money from one place and bringing it to another, even if there is that disposable cash available there. The idea that is that if the community, the local people, don't support it, then perhaps you're not doing what the local people need. So that's why you need to convince them first and be able to attain their support. Finally, it's open and transparent, and I think this is important. We as the Dialogue Society organized a conference in 2007 at the House of Lords, SOAS and LSE. And Eileen was one of our editors. When we went to people and said, look, we're doing this conference, they said, look, it cannot be a propaganda event. We said, fine, we don't want it to be. So we had, and I, I haven't heard of this before, maybe, maybe it has, but not in the conferences I've done or, or attended. We had 16 people on an independent editorial board, including the likes of Tim Winter, uh, uh, Professor Mohammed Abdul Halim, and Eileen herself. And all of the abstracts and all of the papers were screened and scored and accepted or declined by that independent editorial board. 
Uh, and we had that scrutiny and openness. We then went, because we had about seven questions about the movement that we didn't have time to discuss in the, in the hours that were provided. So we took 40 UK-based academics and I went to Turkey and I said, look, these people have questions, you need to answer them. We need to have this deliberation. And we had seven panels over seven days with seven independent chairs, each panel lasting two and a half hours. One of the questions, for example, one of the panel headings was finance. Where does it come from? The other one was about women. The other one was about education. The other one was about dialogue. And we had 40 UK-based academics who, were met, who met with the practitioners of this movement discussing this. The point is that the movement wants critique, it invites scrutiny, it wants to be open, and, and it is open in, in the work that it does. In terms of its criticism, it attracts criticism from two quarters in Turkey. One, uh, from those who are militantly secular, who feel that, that, that what Gülen is doing is about... They feel that Gülen is putting on a facade, he's trying to uh, Islamicize the Turks, that he's not really this reasonable, charming, moderate person. Uh, the other quarter of the religious far-right extremists who are saying, well, 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 in fact, this man isn't actually a Muslim at all, and that um, he's trying to Christianize the Turks through this dialogue. So he does attract criticism from those quarters, and there are some recommended books out there that you can have a look. Uh, apologies for the speed at which this was delivered and any incoherence along the way. Thank you. The timetable has slipped a little bit, but I think you'll agree that it's very important that, uh, that we, we take advantage of such a rich presentation and, and field the normal number of questions. So who wants to go first? Gulen is informed by the Sufi thought. Mevlana Jalaluddin Rumi, Yunus Emre, some might disagree, Imam Rabbani, these are the various figures. He's, he's very well read in that, and that does inform his thinking, that does inform his discourse. He is not a Sufi in the sense that he is attached to a particular Sufi order. And the movement are not Sufis in the sense that they follow a particular ritual. A Sufi order, somebody you go, you subscribe to a, a, a sheikh, somebody who is in charge, and they give you particular rituals that you will do, uh, that are supererogatory, you don't have to do them, but you do them to become more pious in your spirituality. Um, Gulen doesn't subscribe to any particular order in that sense, but he derives uh, inspiration from them all. He refers to them in his works and in his books, uh, and it informs his discourse. Um, and as a result, the, 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 the key elements about the movement is that they are very uh, pro-dialogue, uh, compassion, understanding, not judgmental. So these are elements that you would find very strongly associated with Sufi orders as well. But they don't follow a particular uh, order as such. Gulen taught and what the movement uh, largely subscribes to is that Islam, being a good Muslim and being a good citizen are not contradictory and they're not mutually <coughs> exclusive. In fact, one necessitates the other, that you can be a good Muslim and you should therefore uh, vote, uh, you shouldn't 
uh, be an anarchist, you shouldn't be anti-state. These are very strong. And Gulen has been criticized for being uh, in favor of uh, supporting uh, the state against anarchy. Um, as a result, yes, you do have uh, this idea that being a good Muslim means that you engage positively, proactively, and sincerely. As I said, for myself and many people in Turkey, we were ambivalent, at, to, to say the best, about whether we could internalize democracy. Many politicians in Turkey who had uh, is Islamic backgrounds and motivations thought that democracy was a means to an end, rather than an end in itself. Because religiously, that's how it was presented. Um, and as I said, Gulen in Turkey was one of the key people to, to be able to shatter that and to be able to say, no, this is an end in itself, we need to perfect it further. Uh, and the same thing about secularism. The EU, for example, Gulen has always been a favorite. Nejmet Din Arbakan, who is the leader of the uh, national uh, outlook movement, Milli Salamet Partisi, and was the, uh, the, the founder of the, the party that our current government uh, derives its roots from, was against the EU and was against secularism in a sense. But Gulen has always been in favor of the EU, has always been in favor of pluralism, dialogue, democracy, and secularism, and human rights. So long as secularism doesn't become anti-religious and anti-religion. Um, so I think that's extremely important. And it, it is true, I do believe, it's, it's very difficult to make a causal link, of course, in, 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 in social sciences. It's, it's very difficult to say this was happened simply because of that. There are many things in Turkey that took place, but this is one of the main uh, discourses, the main influences, I believe, that led the current government and party to shed its Islamist identity. To, to be honest, I mean, we have, I'm, I'm critical of the government myself in, in, in other respects, but I don't agree that they're an Islamist party at all. Uh, and I think that that transformation, they might be pious, they might be inspired, as I said, by, by religion originally, but, but currently they've shed that, and, and part of that, I think, is because of their interaction with, with the movement at large. Um, if you look at the Abant meetings that they were holding uh, in the 1990s, the first was on Islam and democracy, Islam and secularism, Islam and human rights. Uh, can it, and I'll, I'll, I'll end on this note, can it extend into the Arab world? I, I, the, I did a paper on this, I'm not trying to promote my own paper, but in, in the 2011-7 uh, conference I did a paper on the, the Gulen movement in the Muslim world. Uh, and the movement is now more active in the Muslim world. It is now attracting more attention in the Muslim world. It does have the credibility of Turkey and the model being extended globally. Uh, and I do think you, you find more and more people within the Arab world and in the Middle East now uh, potentially being able to subscribe to that kind of thinking.